Hello and welcome back to another Raw Sport F1 special. Um, I'm Will Kingswood, obviously your host, and today we're going to be looking at the Austrian Grand Prix, a race that, again, after Styria, it was it was a fairly average race. I think we've we've been treated a lot this season, and this it was time for a few fairly average races back to back in Styria and Austria. But hopefully. This week, we're coming to Britain. It's always a good race in Britain. And especially with the first sprint qualifying of the season. But obviously, I can't talk about this and the previous race on my own. So I've got another guest. You saw him last week. You saw him the week before. It's Raw Sports Head of News, Cam, or Raw's Head of News, sorry, Cam Hall. How are you doing, Cam? It's great to be here. It's great to have gained another job title in the couple of weeks since the end of term. But yeah, fantastic to be on the stream today. Austrian Grand Prix, I thought it was said pretty average race. Um, some very good individual performances. I'm sure we'll come on to talk about Lando Norris, a real star that weekend, confirming almost his meteoric rise beyond even what I think most commentators already thought. Thought a very good drive before the start of the season, but going completely beyond what we imagined he could have done at the start of the season. A very, I thought a reasonably good race and some some quite interesting moments. I think throughout. Uh, yeah, um, we may as well get started. Um, just running through the race results, we have Verstappen, Bottas, then Norris in third place, Hamilton, Sainz, Perez after his um, 10 second time penalty, which we'll come on to, Ricardo, Leclerc, Gasly, and Alonso rounding out the top 10. I mean, I guess first we'll come to number number one, Max Verstappen. He didn't put a foot wrong. I mean, Grand Slam, you can't do anything better than that, can you? You can't. And that's really the most I can say about Max Verstappen from this weekend, because there was nothing that he did wrong the entire time. And he is just looking so utterly dominant, so utterly in control of the season at the moment. It's really hard to see him not going on to win the championship now. His performances in that last triple header, starting off in Paul Ricard and then going to the two races at the Red Bull Ring, have been faultless. This is a mark of a driver who is looking extremely likely to win the championship this season. And that performance in Austria just confirmed that. The fact he built up the gap to be able to go and pit that second time and take the fastest lap as well. There is nothing. There is nothing more that Verstappen could do. He looks completely unassailable this season. And I think these last three races, but particularly both of the races at the Red Bull Ring, have just shown that. Yeah, and I mean, it's such a change from, we remember back to even three years ago in 2018, he started off with the run of um, consistent mistakes, but now you've seen that he probably should have had five wins in a row. Monaco, obviously he didn't win at Baku, but that wasn't his fault. He got really unlucky. And then the last three wins have all, all been really dominant. And like, it just seems that he has become a very complete driver at a very young age. He's been a very complete driver for a long time now. I'd say sort of since that middle period of 2018, but particularly I'd say since the start of 2020, he's really started to be that more complete driver. The difference was in 2020, he didn't have the car to be able to fight Mercedes consistently. The Mercedes had a car that no one could touch. This year, Red Bull have the quickest car on the grid. Mercedes are there or thereabouts near to them. And Verstappen is completely extracting everything he can out of his machinery in the same way that Lewis Hamilton has been doing consistently in his Mercedes for the last few seasons. So Verstappen is taking advantage of everything that's working in his favor to put in these performances, because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how good your car is. If you're not putting in the performances to deliver, that's totally irrelevant. It's totally academic. He's putting in the performances with the machinery that he's been given. And he's showing why so many people over the last few years have talked him up as a potential future multiple times world champion. And I think just watching those performances, he said over the last five races, we could be talking about a driver had everything gone to plan for Verstappen in Baku. We could be talking about a driver with nearly two races advantage on Lewis Hamilton, who after the first four races, having won three of them, looked like he was pretty secure at the top of the championship, looked like he was going to deliver and pull off that consistency that Lewis does. The last few races have changed that so much. And Max Verstappen looks almost unbeatable at the moment. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that most people don't seem to realise is the consistency that he's had. I think I saw a stat on Twitter since the start of 2020, the only race that he has finished that he's not finished on the podium was Turkey. 
and that was obviously the race he made the mistake behind Perez. But those conditions were obviously treacherous. And the fact that he's managed to finish on the podium at every race that he has finished, like it almost blows your mind. It's the sort of consistency that we have seen from Lewis Hamilton in like in the last few years. But now it's just seemed to be Max Verstappen displaying it. Absolutely. He's got rid of those kind of those little mistakes and those bad days that Verstappen had had in the past. Now, of course, he's benefited from having a quicker car. Of course, in 2020, he had the second quickest car on the grid by quite a margin. This year, Red Bull have the fastest car. Now, that helps, definitely. But at the end of the day, the driver has to be the one who brings it home. That race in Turkey, I think it was almost a little bit of of an anomaly. The track was very wet. The drivers were struggling. It's not the most to read into that, but the fact yeah, as you, that stat you bring up just shows how consistent Verstappen has been. He's always been there at the top, and when he's been given that opportunity, he's always gone on to maximise everything that he has in front of him. That's why we're talking about him as the pro- probable world champion now this season. That's why we're talking about him as a probable multiple times world champion going forward, because he's ironed out those things earlier on in his career that were the things that would have held him back in the same way that Lewis Hamilton was always prone to a bad day in his early years in his Formula One career. And that was what many people said was holding him back from going forward to be that multiple time world champion. Verstappen's killed the thing that Lewis, that kind of the thing that held him back in a way that Lewis was held back by that inconsistency. And now we're starting to see just what he can do. And I don't think there's anything else you can really say about Verstappen at the moment because he's delivering on that potential and it's frightening. If I was at any of the other drivers on the grid, any of the other teams, I would be frightened by seeing just how consistent and how fast Verstappen has been this season. Yeah, and uh, at the moment, it just seems like he will be world champion this season. But we'll come on to his main competitors. We'll just look at Mercedes together. It's a fairly, fairly anonymous race for Mercedes. Obviously, Bottas in second, Hamilton in fourth. Uh, Hamilton seemed to pick up a bit of damage from what we were hearing over the radio, but it just, they just, the problem Mercedes sort of have at the moment is that they're very much definitely behind Verstappen, but definitely ahead of the rest of the field. So they're they're in a bit of a no man's land. They're in the position that Red Bull were in last season, except the only difference is that they have two drivers who can at least fight at the front. The Valtteri Bottas, I think, has to be given credit for his performances in the last couple of races and how much more consistent he has been in at least fighting with Perez and fighting near the top. But yes, Lewis Hamilton, I think, started off the season very well. I think almost surprised a lot of people at the start of the season, the fact that Mercedes were talking down the car, yet he was able to compete with Verstappen. He was able to use strategy to his advantage. He was able to get those victories that Mercedes needed really to be able to have him win the Drivers' Championship and fight as well for the Constructors. Now what we're seeing this sort of in the last few races that Red Bull have really started to make their advantage count. Mercedes just haven't been there. And I don't think it's necessarily the fault of the driver. Of course, Lewis Hamilton had damage in this race. I think they made the right call letting Bottas go ahead and hold on to that second place because with Norris breathing down both of the Mercedes necks, there was a real risk that Norris could have been ahead of both of them there. Not the best move maybe for the driver's championship in terms of the team decision though. Probably the best thing to do, but Mercedes need to do something with the car. They need to just do more to get pace out of that car. They are bringing upgrades to Silverstone. So it'll be interesting to see what these do. But Mercedes just need to extract more pace out of that car because we've seen on tracks that Mercedes have typically been suited to, these high downforce tracks that that Mercedes has always ticked on in the last few seasons. They were worryingly slow compared to the Red Bull in these last few races and that must surely have set alarm bells ringing at Brackley. Yeah and I mean it is good to see um, Bottas up in second obviously ahead of Hamilton in fourth but it almost seems to be a little bit too late especially with sort of what's been going on especially like on Twitter over the last few days it always seems to be like the Mercedes and the George Russell George Russell's account <laughs> just teasing everyone and it does seem that they although it's not confirmed that Russell does seem to with the with the way he's talking way he's expressing himself especially on Twitter seems to have got the seat for 2022 Yeah, George Russell will be a Mercedes driver next season. There is no doubt about that. You wouldn't get this much noise about a move if it wasn't going to go ahead. In the same way that Lewis Hamilton's move to Mercedes 
started off with a scoop from Eddie Jordan. Then there was all the noise building on Twitter, people talking about these secret discussions. Then the move got confirmed two weeks later. I think it would have been interesting if Mercedes had announced it this weekend, being George Russell's home race, having that all British lineup. They don't have a German Grand Prix to announce it at, so I'm not entirely sure what Mercedes plans are to announce George Russell as their second driver, but that will be happening next season. And yeah, Valtteri Bottas, his start to the season cost him. Those races, like obviously Imola, the fact obviously, yes, he did get crashed into by George Russell, but the fact he was fighting at the lower ends of the top 10 really was problematic. In the same way in Baku as well, Bottas was just nowhere. And that start to the season, I think, has really cost Bottas in the eyes of Mercedes, especially as we've seen some phenomenal performances, just like the one last weekend in Austria for George Russell, where he came so close to that first point for Williams. It's those performances that means George Russell will be a Mercedes driver next season. Bottas won't be off the grid next season. I can guarantee he'll have a seat in Formula 1. My best guess, I've heard some talk about him going to Alfa Romeo. My best guess, I think it'll be a straight swap between George Russell and Valtteri Bottas. I think Williams will look want that experienced driver to help them rebuild. Bottas, obviously a former driver for the team, has a very strong relationship as well with Williams. Of course, Toto Wolff used to be the main majority shareholder in Williams, obviously at Mercedes at the moment. They've got that technical partnership. So it's a move that I think would satisfy all sides, even if Bottas is dropping into a less competitive team. He'd be given the resources to build the team potentially around him. And I think that would be a move that would excite him. But yes, George Russell's going to be a Mercedes driver next season. Valtteri Bottas cost himself at the start of the season. But that consistency he's showing now is going to be key for Mercedes going on throughout the season. Yeah, you mentioned Valtteri Bottas's slow start. And that means that he's still in fifth place in the World Championship behind, obviously, Hamilton, Verstappen, the Perez. And the I'd say the breakout star of the season so far, if we... If we get rid of Verstappen, like we expected Verstappen to do as well as he did, to be all honest. But just seeing that the person in third in the race and fourth in the championship, Lando Norris, I mean, that I would argue that was his best performance of his F1 career so far. Yeah, there's two stats this season about Lando Norris that have impressed me so much. Firstly, he's the only driver to finish every race in the points this, this season. Now, obviously, Lewis Hamilton aside from his mistake in Baku, would be different. But that just shows you the sheer consistency that he has. More importantly, in the stat that's more impressive, in all races bar one this season, Lando Norris has finished in the top five. His other result was eighth. That says everything you need to know about the consistency with Lando Norris. And we've been saying this now over the last couple of weeks. The difference between McLaren and Ferrari at the moment is that McLaren have that one driver in Lando Norris that... They don't have a Daniel Ricciardo, neither Ferrari driver has at the moment, where they are consistently picking up those big points finishes. Lando, Lando Norris hasn't, again, he's only had three podiums all season, but because of that sheer consistency that he's had, that's why he's been able to put himself in the championship in that fight with Bottas and Perez. That's why McLaren are ahead of Ferrari at the moment. This was the complete performance from Lando Norris this weekend, getting on the front row. Nearly getting pole as well, so close to getting pole. That McLaren was a ve- looked very good in sector two, in particular. The lap times there were incredible, and then just seeing him in the race as well. Yes, of course, obviously he, le- he. I don't think he necessarily saw he was in a fight with Mercedes at the start of the race, but that McLaren, in a way that it doesn't normally do, where Mercedes and Red Bull pull away, was sticking with the Mercedes and the Red Bulls throughout that race. And the fact he was able to take the fight to Lewis Hamilton and keep Bottas on his toes throughout the rest of the race. This has been, this was his most impressive drive throughout in his career. No doubt about that. And if anyone I think has had any doubts about Lando Norris's potential to win a world championship, given the right car, we're seeing now what he can do. And that it is very exciting. That's all I can say. Yeah. We spoke about Lando Norris a lot um, on the last, last, uh, last sort of podcast we did and obviously almost putting it on hold i think have you seen the f1 i think it's f1 ghost twitter account so it's like uh i think i, it's I, like, I need to give it a follow yeah but he was ahead it's really good to see comparison and he was ahead until the final corner where i think Ooh. he just verstappen just had a better exit and managed to sneak it but i mean second in the race he was he was being asked by his engineer to try and keep the mercedes behind without using his tires which i think 
just shows the confidence McLaren have in him at the moment that they know or they think that he can do these things. And he was matching Mercedes on pace, like throughout the throughout the race. Absolutely. And the fact that he was able to do that, given that they've not been really been able to do it at any races so far, that there's you can tell that I think all the talk we've had this season or coming into the season was that Daniel Ricardo is going to assert himself. He's going to of course, give Norris a run for his money and Norris is going to respond to that. But the expectation was Ricardo would be the number one, that driver who's going to give McLaren that boost to let them go and be able to fight for race wins and fight potentially for championships. What we're seeing is that Norris has had all this potential and he's not, he's the one who's asserted himself. Obviously, Ricardo's still settling into the team and if he can settle in and get on the same level as Lando Norris, that could be, that could be a very exciting partnership. Uh, McLaren, but I think Norris has completely outperformed any expectations almost anyone had of him, and he's just showing himself to be that complete driver on and off the track. He is an asset to McLaren. He's an asset to Formula One. He is, in many ways, I think, a lot a, a model for future Formula One drivers. And this on has seeing his performances on the track this season, I think, has only confirmed that. So, yeah, a very exciting prospect, someone who will be fighting for championships, someone who I think will be a world champion in that right, in the right car in the future. I mean, to be fair to Ricardo, still still seventh um, at the finish. And if we go back to Norris quickly, he would have been almost, he said he would have been second if he hadn't had a five second time penalty for <sighs> track limits. And the track limits issues were, were a thing that ha- bubbled on throughout the race. Obviously, Norris getting um, his penalty after the safety. I think it was the safety car restart. Yeah, just just coming down into turn four for anyone into... who hasn't seen. I say for anyone who hasn't seen the footage. Obviously, um, if move with Perez, Perez pushed off the track or allegedly pushed off the track. That's why Norris got the penalty. Perez, of course, got two penalties. I think for doing the same with Charles Leclerc as well. Yeah, yeah, that was it. So. If if you haven't seen it, think um, Hamilton album last year, but they were a bit more on oh. alongside <laughs> alongside one another. Um, Perez forced off the track, drops down to tenth, and then later on in the race, Perez does exactly the same thing to Charles Leclerc at turn four, and then turn oh, it must have been out of turn five. I think he's just coming into out of turn six. Yeah, I can't do I can't do turn <laughs> numbers. But I mean, what what are your what are your opinions on I guess the three incidents as a whole? Would you? I mean, personally, I don't think any of them were penalties. But would you rather they were more consistent or more right? You've got to. I think you've got to be prioritize consistency because I think drivers. The the problem with these track limit rules, and this has been the debate all season, is that. Track limits has been something that's been a huge debate for the last few years and the rules change between sessions. It's complicated. The drivers don't necessarily know what's going on. Michael Massey, to his credit, said at the start of the season, we're going to be more strict on track limits. He's given stricter guidance before the start of each race. And so we've seen it in qualifying and we've seen it be more effective there. But fundamentally, when it comes to racing, the thing is with racing is that it is a bit tough. By its nature, you are going to have drivers being pushed to the edge. If a driver goes off the track as a result of another driver overtaking them, it's not necessarily a bad overtaking move. It's just drivers racing to the edge and racing to acceptable limits. And the thing about these penalties, and I think there's a lot to discuss, not just with that, but with the penalty point system as well, is is what the drivers are doing when they're making these moves. Is it necessarily unsafe? Just because a driver is potentially pushed off the track or not being given necessarily the space if the driver doesn't the other driver's being overtaken doesn't back out of it is that necessarily unsafe is that necessarily worth a penalty and i would say no so in the case of norris and perez i think perez probably should have backed out of that move norris was ahead going into the corner i think perez probably should have done more there to be careful i think with both of perez's with Charles Leclerc as well Again, I think it's a very it's a very difficult one, but I think Leclerc probably could have backed out. I think his move into turn six, where he got pushed off there, I would probably say was the harshest penalty. I think that Leclerc, Leclerc sure was ahead going into that corner, but he was overtaking on the outside in a very difficult overtaking spot. No one normally overtakes into turn six. By Leclerc's own admission, that would have been a very daring overtake 
almost the expectation was he was going to hang it there. He probably would have gone off the track anyway. So I, I do think there needs to be more clarification on drivers racing to the limits and using these track limits because I think fundamentally the stewards need to encourage good racing whilst encouraging its safety. But, but just because a driver's pushed off the track, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's unsafe, especially on a lot of other circuits where you have much more expansive runoffs in mm -hmm. on a lot of the more modern F1 circuits. The Red Bull Ring doesn't have that, but it's not necessarily unsafe. And I think there needs to be much more of a push, particularly in the races, because I think they're getting the track limits right increasingly in qualifying but it's about allowing drivers to race, allowing drivers to overtake, but allowing them to do it safely. And just because, as I said, just because a driver leaves the track doesn't necessarily mean it's unsafe. Yeah, I mean, the first incident that I would probably think was fairly similar, again, I didn't I didn't think it was a penalty, was uh, Verstappen and Hamilton at Imola. So, I mean, for obviously, first, first lap, first lap carnage, the FIA seemed to be a bit less strict when it comes to that. But you did see... Verstappen pushed Hamilton off at turn one. But I mean, I don't think that's a penalty, but I don't think any of these are a penalty. And I do think that it is because there are a lot of tracks where if you do get pushed off the track, there's very little punishment. I'm thinking your Paul Ricard, your Sochis, your Abu Dhabis, where there's runoff and as far as the eye can see. And there's, no, there's not really any punishment for going off the track and perhaps there needs to be track modifications maybe put a strip of strip of like, like gravel or grass on the edge of like on the on the limit so you can't go beyond the limits and um, just exploit like the runoff that has been introduced for the purposes of safety i mean that that would have that could have safety concerns i think be interesting so particularly grass on the edge of tracks we know a lot of circuits for example suzuka is the most obvious one i can think of where you have a lot of grass at the edge of the white line, at the speeds that you're going at Suzuka, go touching that grass. We've seen a lot of drives. I think Danny Kvyat's crash in qualifying in 2015, how horrific that was. Imagine if that was in a racing situation with another car being overtaken. So it's a it's a very difficult one. I think the key thing that the stewards need to finalise with this, the thing that they need to work out is when a driver is being over, when it's sort of two drivers going into like a corner, for example and someone is being pushed off the track, has the both drivers been given enough space to race? Has And again, sometimes you do, the door will be closed on you, but say you've got a situation where you've got two drivers coming into it's The turn six at Hockenheim was always the most, the hairpin there was always the most obvious example of this, where the driver on the inside would often like to push the driver off the track almost. Now, had the driver had enough space by that, have they got, not necessarily a car's width, but the opportunity to back out of the move. Or is the driver literally being driven to be pushed off the track where they've literally got no other option but to go off? Now, if that's the case, that's probably worth a penalty. But if the driver who is doing the overtaking at least leaves the door open to have a bit of space, even if that is to put your nose in and then back out, it not, it's not necessarily... That, 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 I would say, is just racing. And if there's an incident that comes of that, it's probably just a racing incident. But... The, the the stewards and the drivers, I think, need to do more to clarify this because one of the things we're seeing with a lot of these penalties is that at times it can feel very arbitrary. And at times, I don't think the drivers almost feel a bit discouraged almost that they're racing to the limit. Then these penalties come in off of a racing incident and it almost discourages them from racing. So I feel this is a conversation we've had a lot of times over the last few seasons there needs to be more clarification here because yeah. ultimately for for getting that racing but getting safe racing as well you've got to strike a balance and i think the fia need to do more to clarify that i mean i think this problem is it's sort of like going through turn four the racing line is to go to the outside of the track like if and if there is a car there then that car will be pushed off and i think yeah like you say there just needs to be clarification over what is and isn't allowed and like i'd say the like if we go back to 2020 like the the, the album hamilton one i say was more of a click up penalty because album was so far ahead and hamilton did drift out did hit him so i think that penalty was fair but just because they were so alongside each other it's a 50 50 corner but obviously the person on the inside's going to have the advantage and the person on the outside just has to deal with that 
Yeah, Ayrton Senna's great maxim of if you no longer go for a gap that exists, you're no longer a racing driver, I feel has to be kind of employed in this sense because drivers will go for gaps. It's their nature. If they see a gap, they'll go for it, even if there is a risk. And we need to give drivers the ability to go for these gaps. And if and again, drivers will do it in a safe way. They will know when to back out if it's unsafe, but they'll know to take every opportunity. And sometimes, like we saw with these over with the incidents, like Charles Leclerc, for example, Charles Leclerc on that third penalty with Perez was going for a gap that he saw. He got yes, he got pushed off the track. But that was in many ways a result of Leclerc making a really daring move at a corner that no one normally overtakes at, and Perez just doing stern defensive driving. But the gap was there for Leclerc to try and exploit it. In the end, he wasn't able to get the gap and he had to go wide. That's not a penalty. That's just two drivers racing to an acceptable limit. So there has to be more, I think, done there. I think more to really get that sense of what is defensive driving, what is unsafe driving. I think it's a conversation because I think if there's anything that we can say, I think drivers, fans, probably even stewards alike, I think are a little bit confused by the rules on track limits and the rules on racing incidents and penalties. And I think that all has to be clarified. Yeah, I mean, we could, we could talk about this. <laughs> we could talk about this forever. But, I mean, we'll move on. I wouldn't say there was much else. Everyone sort of had quite a standard drive, didn't they? We had uh, Sainz doing well to get up to fifth. Uh, Ricardo seventh, Leclerc eighth, Gasly ninth, Alonso tenth. Fairly, fairly standard results. But I mean, we can talk about the driver in eleventh. How about that? Oh, George, I'm George, heartbroken. <laughs> George Russell, he got into Q three on merit, which is the first first time Williams have been in Q three since Italy twenty eighteen, I think. So three years since. Um, poor. I think it was a poor start. I think he dropped down to 12th from 8th, which seems to seems to sort of be a characteristic of George Russell. Poor starts when it sort of matters, but then drove a, drove a good race up in 10th until Alonso overtook him. And to be fair to Alonso, he he said afterwards that he would, would have rather it be any other driver than George Russell. But again, racing's racing. He's got to get that point for his team. I mean, what do you, do you want, want to add anything, Cam? I don't think there's anything more really to add. George Russell is just a driver who I don't know if it's bad luck. I don't know because some of this, some of the reasons he's not had points in the fault in the past have been his fault. Some of it have been mechanical issues. Some of it's just been the pace of that Williams. That man just needs more luck. That man just needs an opportunity to go right for him because there's no doubt he's got the talent. We saw it in particularly in that race when he was up in Mercedes at Sakir last year. He's clearly a very talented driver who's going to fight and probably win world championships in the future. He just needs something like this to go right for him. He drove a faultless race apart from the start. Yes, he lost positions at the start, but the way he made positions up, the strategy was quite an interesting thing throughout this race as well. And sort of the differences between the one and the two stops. If he could have made a one-stop work, that probably might have been able to give him that point because the one-stop did seem to be the better strategy, so at least certainly compared to a lot of the two-stop runners. Whether George Russell had the time management to do that, we don't really know. But certainly, he was, he could have come so close to getting that first point. And it will come. It's going to come sometime soon. I don't know where. Don't know when. I'm going to say the Hungara ring is probably going to be his next best chance to get it. And I hope he gets it at the Hungara ring because I don't think there's any thing, any driver more deserving of a point right now than George Russell. No, like, I mean I've always said that as soon as one point comes for Russell in a Williams, then he'll get he'll get more. And I mean he we had to, he has been unlucky a few times. It's also I mean he had a I'm thinking just to last season, um, Magello had a poor start. I think was one of only two drivers not to score a point there because they only only had 12 because no one no one knew how to do a safety car restart um obviously Imola this year and last year um spearing off into the wall at Comilorale behind the safety car and colliding with Bottas and then Austria arguably those were the two that weren't his fault the most issue in the steering Grand Prix and he was I think two or three laps away from getting a point in Austria and but he would have he was being harassed at the end by Reichen and, and Vettel, but then they also forgot how to drive. Oh, that was such it was such a weird it, incident. Cause like 
it just was odd. I, I, I honestly, it, it reminded me a little bit of the incident that Vettel had a few seasons ago with Lance Stroll on the slowdown lap in Malaysia, where Lance Stroll inexplicably sideswiped Vettel going through turn six on on the slowdown lap where they're all driving really slowly. I that that was hard to explain, but this one because the thing is Vettel seems so far ahead. That was the thing. Vettel had clearly come out of turn four. He was ahead of Raikkonen. And Kimi almost just had his car on the on the outside and just almost was like, yeah, I'm still going for this. I'm still in this, even though he's clearly still ahead of me. And if I'm going to stay in this and where the nature of the way that the track was turning right, we're going to have this dangerous collision. I, I don't know. I've, I don't know if this, there's been some people I know who have said that this is the sign that Kimi Raikkonen should leave for me, the one that his age is starting to compromise his driving. I wouldn't say it's that. I'd say it was a very stupid mistake from a driver who, with hit the amount of races he has under the belt, should not be making those mistakes. Don't necessarily think it affects whether he'll be on the grid next season. I think a lot of that's more down to the sort of internal politicking of Formula One. But certainly not a good move at all by Raikkonen and deservedly getting the penalties and the penalty points from that because there was no, there's nothing you can say about that move apart from just reflecting on its stupidity really yeah i mean i it just seemed they sort of just like magnetized together it was it was, <laughs> it was a very odd one and you you've just reminded me about penalties about and how every single driver on the grid outside of the top 10 it seemed got penalties left right and center i think sonoda had two for crossing the pit line on entry i think latifi and mazapin got one for yeah i've, 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 I've got the, the safety car I've okay, got the full really, list of penalties here. I've managed really to quickly. go onto Wikipedia. So we have Sergio Perez's 10 second time penalties, the two five second ones for the Charles, the Charles Leclerc incidents, which we've discussed already. Yuki Tsunoda got a five second time penalty for crossing the line at the pit entry. Again, understandable. The rules say you can't obviously cross the line. But again, the, the Austria entry is quite an interesting one. It does come through that fast corner, but it's obviously the safety coming in and out of the pit lane. So that's understandable. Lance Stroll getting a five second time penalty for speeding in the pit lane. There's no excuse for speeding in the pit lane. There's a reason that speed limit is there. Um, then Kimi Raikkonen, obviously. So he had the post race drive through penalty, which became the 22nd penalty. Um, however, he was able to stay in 15th because he finished actually. So Kimi Raikkonen finished behind Nicholas Latifi on the track, but Nicholas Latifi, um, received a 30-second time penalty for not respecting double yellow flags caused by Kimi's incident and ended up finishing the race behind Kimi Raikkonen. There you go. Um, Nikita Mazepin, also just one last penalty, got a ten, another 10-second stop-go time penalty, so the equivalent of that, the 30-second penalty, um, for not respecting double yellow flags. Although, as Wikipedia um, like has also put at the end of its sentence, made no difference to his race result because he was last anyway. <laughs> But yeah, it, it's a lot of penalties. And interestingly as well, of course, going to the penalty point system, because I know this is something that's caused a lot of controversy, is a lot of pe the penalty points being awarded for these incidents throughout the race. So um, Charles Leclerc, so Sergio Perez getting four for his incidents with Charles Leclerc, Lando Norris getting two for his incidents with um, Sergio Perez. Interestingly, I don't think any of the drivers who sped in the pit lane... Oh, I'm not entirely sure what the case with those with the double yellow flags. But certainly drivers who speed in the pit lane don't seem to get penalty points. So I don't know if that's something else the F FIA need to look at. I think it's interesting as well, especially coming to Latifi and Mazepin, that they did get penalised for like not respecting double wave yellows. Because obviously we've had the issues. We had it in Azerbaijan where it seemed... With the with the new radio that everyone seems everyone loves, I love it personally. With the Michael Massey talking to the entire grid, it does seem that if you're gonna, you maybe should apply the rule to everyone. Maybe give everyone a ten second stop stop go penalty, and just that you have to deal with it because it is ultimately a safe. It's a safety issue, like especially if double wave yellows. Those are like the, the harshest, or not the harshest. They're the biggest warning of danger up until we get to the virtual safety car and then the actual safety car and it's interesting that they don't seem to penalize it when it's everyone but do seem to penalize it when it's sort of just latifi and mazepin when to be honest doesn't really matter 
It's it's a very complicated rule with double yellow flags, and it's been that whole sort of dilemma of how much do I back off to be safely within the limit, but also how much do I keep going to be able to be competitive? Because ultimately, racing drivers are racing drivers. They will do everything they can to minimise time and keep themselves competitive. The double wave yellows, particularly in the last few years, um, with your Bianchi's incident, has a real kind of tragic element to this debate. And it's something that the virtual safety car, I think, to its credit, has, I think, resolved a lot of. But clearly, I think what this race has shown is there's still that issue with double wave yellow flags and the fact that drivers um, don't necessarily um, always back off for it. And given the recent sort of implications and the recent kind of incidents surrounding that, again, this is something the FIA really need to clarify. We know they have the Delta Times um, for the virtual safety car and for the safety car. I don't know if there's a way they can have deltas in yellow flag zones because, of course, obviously you don't want drivers going too slowly and abruptly coming to a stop because that in itself is a safety issue. So I think the drivers really, there does need to be some clarification on that because it is something that where safety is concerned has to be prioritised. Yeah, I mean, it just seems clarification is the is the moral of the story. It just needs it, everything just needs to be clarified a bit better. But what I'll do quickly is run through the drivers' standing. So we've got Verstappen on one hundred eighty two, Hamilton on one fifty, Perez on one hundred and four, Norris one hundred one, Bottas still on ninety two, Leclerc sixty two, Sainz sixty, Ricardo forty, Gasly thirty nine, and Vettel sitting on thirty points. But I think that. I think that covers the Austrian Grand Prix. Still not a wet race. Why can't it ever rain? And it's definitely, it's definitely <laughs> not going to rain. It's definitely not going to rain this week as well because it's like a million degrees. The, the British country, weather has especially. blessed us. <laughs> sure, it should be an interesting one. But we'll come on to some of the uh, news that has come outside the sport, over, or not outside the sport, outside the racing over the last few weeks. And I guess we'll we'll do it in order actually. So first. We had a few days ago, actually, no, not a few days ago, just a few days after the Austrian Grand Prix, Australia dropping off the calendar. Um, obviously, the Australian government felt that they couldn't or they didn't want F1 risking an outbreak. And to be, if we move away from the world of sport and into the world, your world, the world of news, we have seen, <laughs> uh, we have seen an increase in um, cases for Australia over the over the last few days. So. I think it's probably probably fair enough. Yeah, I mean, one of the most important things to say with my head of news hat on here, kind of looking at all of the kind of the different COVID responses throughout the world, the Australian response has been very distinct from a lot of the responses in Europe and the United States. Its strategy has always been to go hard on any COVID outbreak at any time, almost more akin to a zero COVID solution. That's why we've seen a lot of lockdowns come in and a lot of tough restrictions where cases have been almost in single or double figures. So that's the first thing to say about the Australian approach. It's a very strict quarantine regime with very low cases. And because of that quarantine restriction, we saw with the Australian Open back in January, before most of the F1 personnel have had opportunities for vaccinations, we saw the controversy that erupted there from the quarantines the players had to go through, the tennis players, you know, were, were not very happy about it. We know Djokovic was very outspoken about the conditions. And the fact the Australian government said, well, We've got to do this. These, This is the toughness of the restrictions that are proportionate to what we have for the rest of the population. And I think the Delta variant has thrown in, I think, a new element that probably pushed Australia off the calendar, which is a shame because the Australian Grand Prix is not necessarily with the racing, but certainly um, in terms of the overall spectacle and the overall kind of Grand Prix, it is always a fantastic weekend. And having it at the end of the season as well, I think would have been quite an interesting experience to see what a racing in Albert Park is like when a championship is potentially up for grabs, not just as the Open or where a lot of teams do tend to be more conservative anyway. There is, as I said um, on last week's show, and I tweeted about this as soon as I heard the news, the big concern for Formula One at the moment is that with the COVID situation still not entirely under control in Mexico and in Brazil, there is a real chance that we don't have a race from the 24th of October till the 5th of December now. So Formula One needs to sort out a programme for November, whether that is a second race in Kota, whether that is China. China, we know, is potentially unlikely. And the Chinese authorities, again, have a very strict quarantine regime that could potentially be problematic for having F1 there. Sepang, 
Kyle Army, all of these tracks that I keep saying we need to have back on the calendar. Maybe another race in Bahrain as well. The point, I think, with this is that with the pandemic still not over, this could be, this is probably not the last race we're going to drop have drop off the calendar next season. We might even still have delays and issues with races in 2022. But I think given the nature of Australia's quarantine regime, this is no surprise whatsoever. Yeah, I mean, I, I was looking forward to Australia this season, especially with the with the new track layout. It does seem to be designed to make the racing better. Obviously, Australia was always, oh, it never really lived up to the hype, but it was always a, always a good start to the season. But I mean, like you said, just for what replacements could there be? I think there's, they, Silverstone have said they're up for running another race. I do, <laughs> I think, I think Europe in November is still a possibility for F1 just because it's, especially if the majority of the, um, like, the majority of the Western Hemisphere's races gets cancelled. Obviously, Cota looks uh, all set to mm. go ahead. Texas government's very, um, very not very locked down happy. But of course, as you said, Brazil and Mexico, if they don't go ahead, we might just we might end up popping over to Cota, and it would make a bit more sense to just shift back to Europe. Maybe go to a Mugello or go to I don't know, and almost maybe an Estoril or or. As Silverstone have offered, go back to Silverstone for a wet November race that will be out, <laughs> freezing cold, absolute carnage. You know, it, will, it still won't rain. That's how you guarantee no rain. Uh, possibly. I mean, all I will say is that if there's 2000 British Grand Prix when they decided for some inexplicable reason, given the temperamental nature of the British climate in mid-April, you know, if F1, F1 did a race there April 2000 and... The everyone complained that weekend of muddy car parks, the track was too wet, the medical helicopter couldn't take off. Those of set practice sessions were cancelled. It was cold. The drivers didn't like it. And if that if that is April, just imagine the idea of Silverstone in November. It's a complete it's a complete no go. I think if you're going to do more races in Europe, it has to be in southern Europe towards the Mediterranean, where the climate is at least a little bit more um, complementary. To forming the one so Mugello and Estoril would probably be the two races I would think of there to probably be most likely there again obviously we've we've gone through most of the other options we have we've done Imola we've done Portimao we've going to do Istanbul so the options are a lot less there there will probably be a second race in Cota I think if either Mexico or Brazil do get cancelled I think more importantly as well for Formula One and for Liberty Media they want a race in the United States it's the race that they always seem to put most of their attention to being an American company as well. So if any of these races are other races are suspended, I can almost guarantee you a second race in Cota. Yeah, I think a second race in Cota does make sense. And it could end up being the race that we see um, the third, I think. So they've confirmed sprint qualifying for Silverstone, obviously we'll talk about that. And Monza and we'll probably end up seeing the third sprint qualifying in Cota, especially if we get a second race, which I personally think is quite a good idea, especially because it just means that you do see like what is the difference between a sprint qualifying and a normal qualifying, like just on the weekend in general. Yeah, I, I, I was surprised in that regard they didn't do it in Austria. If that, if that, To have that direct comparison, I think, is more beneficial. I can obviously understand why you'd want to do it in Silverstone, because Silverstone has a lot of overtaking opportunities on it. So it is the kind of track where you can try it. But yeah, having that direct comparison, I think, is going to be particularly useful. And I think if we are kind of set now and probably having two races in Cota, it makes perfect sense to do that. Yeah, I mean, I'm just disappointed we're not going to see a Italian uh, Italian qualifying carnage. Uh, we'll still see it on Friday. <laughs> <laughs> it just won't matter as much when they all pile out of the pile out of the pits with um, a minute and a half to go. But oh, now, don't don't remind me of that. It's watch. still that that final session in 2019 still <laughs> still triggers me. Just re- I that just remember funny, watching that. that been, the funniest thing I've ever seen. Ever. I was shouting at the TV, just telling the drivers to go. Like that is if you have if any of the view of our viewers or listeners haven't seen that yet. Just literally type in 2019 Italian GP qualifying. There's a whole video of that complete farce. Watch it in full. You, it is just 
utterly farcical, but hilarious I mean, was, at the same time. It was almost better in 2020 because they actually got to the line and there were like four of them <laughs> racing around racing around turn three at the same time. <laughs> so good. <sighs> oh, I can't wait to go back. That's going to be so good. Right, but again, other than that, we've had the Hamilton Commission release their report um, on a sort of diversity in F1. And I think they, they have said that there needs to be more diversity in F1. I would say F1 has responded to it quite well, obviously. Like, I think it's uh, I think it's 10 places at university, six internships and one apprenticeship, I think, are the initial, initial um, details. And, I mean, it just shows that F1, I think F1 is trying to be more diverse, and it shows how the power of almost Lewis Hamilton, in a way, he's sort of almost transcended the racing itself and is now one of the biggest spokespeople, like, for F1 in general like, and just issues within F1. Yeah, absolutely, and F1, to their credit, have acknowledged that they haven't always been, or diversity is an issue in Formula 1. They they acknowledge that they acknowledge the barriers that there are that the sport and the fact it is typically governed by money. It's typically concentrated in a few areas of the world amongst a few kind of groups of people who've always been able to benefit from a lot of the resources to get into Formula One. F one acknowledges that it's had these problems, and I think Liberty have been really good at sort of saying that they need to make these improvements and they need to encourage more diversity. The Hamilton Commission, I think, has been fantastic. And I think the thing that was really good about it was it didn't just show not just kind of Formula One specifically, but it also did. So I think one of the stats, I believe it was 3% of, um, or I think 97% of students, sorry, will not be taught um, by a person of colour in schools. And it really showed, I think, just how much the Hamilton Commission was not trying to just get at sort of the top level into Formula One, but also in many of the kind of the training that young people have as well, many of the inspirations that young people have to get into engineering, to get into these professions. And the fact that there is just a lack of diversity. And I think it's been really good to kind of have that illuminated. And Lewis Hamilton, as you said, has been a fantastic spokesperson on racial justice, really bringing to light a lot of the lack of diversity in motorsport and within many of the training and education that allows people to go into motorsport. So it's really great to see that the FIA and Formula One have taken that on board, that they are going to put these recommendations into action. We saw literally the night the report came out at um, Formula One management and Liberty Media announced all these new internships, announced all of these things that they're going to be doing. It's very clear that they're taking steps to address their lack of diversity. And yeah, Lewis Hamilton, as you said, has been fantastic in really bringing these issues to light. And I think it does the image not just a Lewis Hamilton, but the image of Formula One good as well. In a time where, you know, very much racial justice and racial inequality is really at the forefront and there's a real emphasis throughout society to address a lot of issues that have been rooted in centuries-long um, centuries long oppression and centuries-long practices. Formula One being at the forefront of that, it can only be, it's only a really good sign. It's fantastic to see that it's taking such action to address it. And I think we can only be proud of the work of Lewis Hamilton, Formula One, and it's very encouraging to see that real push for diversity going forward now. Yeah, and I think that I think it's the fact that F1 or F1 management were so quick to like you know, they don't this isn't the end of the process, this is the beginning of the process, mm. but they were so quick to begin the process to start making changes. And you you would hope that this process will continue whereas like i don't know we compare it to obviously the awful awful abuse that um the uh, sancho rashford and saka received after missing their penalties in the um european championship final the the foot i can't really think of what the football world there's obviously always the calls of banning banning people like imprisoning people who do spout this racial abuse but i don't think there's been that much from the football world about what they can do to stop this whereas if you look if you look to f1 you avoid i feel like you've always seen there especially now with the hamilton commission report that even like even for the past few years there has been a push to make um make f1 more inclusive especially as we're welcoming in the drive to survive audience we're welcoming in people who have watched that show 
like what the Netflix generation who may be more in tune with social issues. And I think F1 recognizes that if we can work with um, with the new fans, make the sport more diverse, it just benefits everyone. Yeah, and I think that's the most important thing. The thing that I think with Formula One and its real push for diversity is that it's not, they know obviously the numbers are a very important thing and the numbers have been really illuminating and we've seen obviously that push to increase diversity amongst um, the staff that Formula One employ. But there's also been a recognition about the cult, as we said earlier, about the culture of motorsport, about the fact that it can feel very cut off um, to marginalised communities who haven't had all of those opportunities previously. And, you know, the fact is you and I can sit here. We can't quantify a, a lot of the marginalisation, a lot of oppression that people of colour have had throughout history. That's it's not something we can necessarily identify with, but it's something that we know that through listening through reports like this, we can really learn from, we can really seek to have that learning process. And that's what Formula One are doing here. They're having that learning process at the moment and working on improving their culture to make it more diverse, to expand those opportunities. And in a way that many of the people who've been traditionally at the top of motorsport don't have that sort of first-hand experience of the sort of marginalization, really taking that time to learn is such a crucial thing. And I think that, we're starting to see from Formula One exactly the sort of steps that need to be taken. And it's, it's only re- there's anything or the only thing you can really say is that it's very encouraging to see. And the fact that they also know this is just the beginning of the process as well. The, the commission's done, I think a fantastic job. And I think it needs to be applauded for all the work that it's done. And just, I would say just to finish off, it's just allowing people to have role models to look up to to and if we start this process it will it will breed further diversity because it will mean people have um like idols to look up to they'll want to emulate someone that is or is more like them than probably probably what they've seen before but that that's obviously something that we're all looking forward to a bit more diversity into f1 over the coming years but can't look that far ahead into the future just at the moment as we talk about the pre- British Grand Prix. Oh, couldn't get my words out. British Grand Prix <laughs> preview. That's a that's a tongue twister, actually. British. It Grand is Prix quite. It, it it does. It's not the easiest one to roll off your tongue. It doesn't. I I don't know. It just doesn't kind of sound as nice as I don't know the Monaco Grand Prix preview or it's the. Too much, it, it's too much like and pr. <laughs> it's very harsh in it you know Ingrat- britain it's, it's like every kind of I'm, I'm not a linguistic student here if any linguistic students are watching please slaughter me on twitter afterwards but you know british grand prix preview it's very the harshest sounds you could probably think about your mouth at that second all in one sentence well i can't can't <laughs> delve on we can't delve on that too long obviously coming back to silverstone um one of the oldest tracks in f1 one of the i would say the best tracks in f1 and just the silverstone is one of i think up there with monaco and probably monza where you don't have track numbers it's where you have corner or don't have sorry not track numbers corner numbers you have corner <laughs> names You've got Maggots, Beckett's, Vale, Stone, um, the Wellington Strait, the new Hamilton Strait that d- goes um, along the start from the Strait. Um, Hangar Strait, that's the one. I almost <laughs> forgot that there. But yeah, I think it's good to good to be back in Britain. Obviously, the last two races there last season, um, Verstappen's first win of the season, um, fairly dominant performance. And obviously, the race before that saw one of the most dramatic finishes of the most dramatic finishes of any season that we've that we've seen in a long long time where Hamilton halfway halfway around the final lap gets a puncture and has to finish on three wheels I mean do you, do you it, was, any... it was impressive just yeah. just just think just remembering that do you have any I mean specific memories of uh Silverstone my other, first other British Grand Prix I remember 2008 in the pouring rain on the old track as well, which personally is still my my favourite version of Silverstone. As much as I do like the new version, the old version going under the bridge. And of course, maybe it's just the overtake for Kimi and Barrichello in 2003 going under the bridge was phenomenal and probably one of my favourite things. But my actually first experience of watching it in 2008 was that race with Lewis Hamilton won by a minute in the pouring rain, won arguably his best performance throughout his career. 
just completely flawless in a race where every other driver, Felipe Massa, is spinning five times that race. Lewis looks so under control. Such a good race, so much so I actually went to the race a year later. I remember being sat um, in one of the stands at Woodcut overlooking the corners coming out the bridge um, through Brooklands into Luffield and just being totally mesmerised that whole weekend. I remember Sebastian Vettel winning that race, taking his second win for Red Bull, his first at Silverstone. Um, that was also the last race that season where McLaren were a total disaster and they got their car sorted for the next race. So if only they could have got it done a week earlier and Lewis Hamilton would have been at the front in Silverstone, that would have been that would have been very nice indeed. But yes, always a fantastic race, Silverstone. Very good overtaking opportunities as well. It's a track that really has that mixture of obviously high downforce through the corners, but long a bit long straights as well, really giving you the drivers opportunities to overtake and some fantastic racing in the last few years in particular the battle i think one battle that comes to my mind the claire and verstappen in 2019 that was one of the best battles you will probably ever watch in formula one both drivers really pushing themselves to the limit there yeah i mean just if you think about the last few years 2018 we had the mercedes and the ferraris line stern into the last 10 laps 2019 i think it was quite an underrated race but you had again red bull ferrari fighting the great battle between hamilton and bottas um around uh the back the back section around i'm i should know these corners what was it luffield into um, luffield through and into yeah. Woodcock. that was fantastic and of course not forgetting the infamous um first lap crash with both half drivers that um, gave us the famous F smash reaction <laughs> from Gunter Steiner on Drive to Survive. Yeah, and then as we mentioned, the two 2020 races again, again two very good races. And you would think that 2021 wouldn't be any different. But as we mentioned earlier, this is also the first time we're seeing a new qualifying format in sprint qualifying. I mean, I've sort, of, sort of run through it. So you've got practice one on Friday, obviously same as normal, but then Friday evening, I think 5.30, correct me if I'm wrong. 5, 5.30, I don't know if it's 5.30, it starts for a six o'clock. Oh, no, it's a 5.30 yeah. start, ignore Just me. Re refer to actual sources, ignore <laughs> us on all times, but yes. We've got um, sort of sort of a standard quali standard qualifying format, Q1, Q2, Q3, and then 20, 15, 10. But that sets the grid for not the race, but this time the sprint qualifying race, a 17 lap race. We don't have don't have to pit for any any tires. Um, where you can just you can just go like flat out, and then that awards the rate the I guess pole position for the actual race which is again on sunday and um, oh yeah i forgot to mention spring uh the spring qualifying is on saturday as well as another practice session early in the morning i mean what what are your what are your opinions on the whole spring qualifying, spring qualifying? i'm really looking for I'm, I'm looking forward to it not necessarily because i think the idea is the best form of ones ever introduced i've always said don't tinker with something that is not broken and qualifying i don't think was broken there's far bigger problems but it's an interesting experiment. This could be a gem that we don't know about. And I can see where it could be. Having the drivers go out on that Saturday and just going flat out, could we could see more mistakes from drivers, of course, coming into the race on the Sunday than if you have drivers who normally be at the top of the grid, more likely to be at the back of the grid to come Sunday, that that could really spice things up on the main race. I do have a few concerns, though, with sprint qualifying. I think, firstly, sure, it's a flat out race, but if the point, there's only points for the top three. So if you're a driver, if the top three are way out ahead and you're fighting for fourth and fifth, are you really going to risk taking each other out of the race if you know you're not going to make a gain? Sure, you get an extra two metres on the grid, but you can easily gain that back in the much longer 52 lap race on Sunday. So I think that could potentially be a problem. It's how much drivers are going to push on the Saturday, especially as the teams I know have been given more money for these races but they still have the same budget cap throughout the season and they really don't, I think, want to have expensive repair bills and breaching the curfews on the Saturday evening if they can avoid it. I think it's going to be an interesting experiment. I hope it goes well because I really think I, I really think that for the fans as well, obviously, this has been orientated at the fans and FOM have made that point. This is very much a move to 
get racing going on where fans are able to watch it and to have the thing that the fans love the most, which is more wheel to wheel action. I hope it goes well. I do have some concerns. I think the concern I just gave about really the, the lack of points being awarded in that race, I would say that's probably my main concern. Of course, in a close championship as well, if the championship comes down to these sprint qualifying races, considering they've not been trolled at every event across the season, I think that could potentially cause some consternation. But as an idea, I'm excited. I have my concerns. But unlike elimination qualifying, I want to be proven right. I, I, I want I want to be surprised by this. Yeah. I want to come yeah. out with a positive feeling. No, I mean, I, I would sort of agree with you on the points, especially. I can understand that it probably won't be a permanent point system and that maybe just because they're essentially using this as a trial, they don't want it to affect the championship too much. And then obviously you can always, they can, the teams can always give feedback saying, oh, if it was worth more points, we would have pushed more and then it would be better racing and things like that. Um, I'm just trying to think. I think that another issue I have is that it could just end up being a, well, I don't know how long Silverstone is normally, but it could just end up being 17 laps on top of the normal race. It's essentially, I saw a, I saw an alternate description on Twitter. It's a, it's a 17 lap race with a 24 hour red flag into the actual race. So I think that could be another issue. It just sorts out and possibly makes the first, the, like the actual race less interesting and potentially the tires could be an issue, especially if we see, I don't know, you are thinking like your Sergio Perez could could be going on a soft tire could he make it last 17 laps probably but if you get a driver that isn't what wants to risk a soft tire i'm thinking like maybe your lower end of the grid your Giovinazzi's, your reichmann's your mazapin's your schumacher's or or your williams is that they might go for a soft but then might suffer tire ish tire blowouts and right at the end of the race especially after what we saw last year we think we had i think four or five over the two races I'm, th- I'm thinking like Kvyat, Sainz, Bottas and obviously Hamilton who did manage to get away get away with it but I am looking I am looking forward to that I do think F1 needs to try new things personally I would have gone for a, rever- for a reverse grid instead of a qualifying session just to just to you make see, it I, a- I, I, I fundamentally hate the idea of reverse grids just because I think the driver's Put the are supposed to be putting effort into their qualifying runs. I almost fear drivers could try and game the system by, you know, potentially just not going out in qualifying, just or putting in these slow laps to get them nearer to the front. And I think it just completely defeats the idea of the sort of meritocratic nature of racing. I think this is preferable. It's not necessarily a perfect solution, but yeah, I think certainly that whole dilemma you had with the kind of the drivers at the back of the grid going for the soft tire, that's perhaps the sort of thing that I think this format encourages is they're very clear that this is a flat out race with no pit stops mandated. I don't know if the expectation is that drivers don't make pit stops, but yeah, I think there's a few things they need to iron out whether I, I haven't checked the rules fully, whether you can use tires from sprint qualifying in the race potentially. So that's something else to kind of add on top of that. But yeah, I think it'll be, it's a trial at the end of the day. I think that's the point that we need to be very clear. It's a trial. Things that work and don't work will be learned from this. And when if sprint qualifying is taken on as a more permanent thing, there will probably be changes to the way it's been done this season. There will be, I think, from what we learn this season, things that we will adapt going forward, potentially to qualifying more generally. And I think it's encouraging to see that instead of just adopting these kind of things as sort of permanent as they did with elimination qualifying and then getting rid of them when we realise they don't work, having these trials at least gives us the opportunity to learn what works in a very more controlled atmosphere and i think that's something i think is going to be beneficial yeah i i mean i I completely agree i think the fact they are trialing it is good and i think what we've seen over the last few years or the last um two years is there's there's been a lot of lot of sort of trialing of different things we've done we've trialed almost obviously we weren't intending to but we have trialed going back to circuits going to new circuits and now we're trialing these new things and it almost feels like it's all building up to 2022 to make to make like the racing better and then 2025 when the new power units come in potentially as well as a new some new manufacturers returning to the sport so i think let's give it a try if it doesn't work it doesn't work 
that's, that's probably the best I could say. Yeah, I totally agree with you there. The, the trials are there for a reason. I'd say if it decides the championship, I'd say that's perhaps where a little bit more controversy comes in just because this has this sprint qualifying has points attached to it in a way that no other system has had before. But it's a trial. It's just an opportunity to see what works and what doesn't work. And I think if it keeps Formula 1 on its toes, it's clearly an attempt to respond to the fans as well, which is very good from Liberty that they're doing that. So we can only be it can only be an encouraging sign, even if it doesn't go well and we bid in the format. It's an encouraging sign that Formula One are listening to the fans and trying to improve the quality of the sport, the quality of the racing, and that can only be a good thing. Yeah, I mean, let's wait and see. It will, it will go well or it will go badly. It will go one of the two, because I mean that's just how F1 works. But we are going to do our predictions now. Well, first we're going to look at last week's predictions. <laughs> And as usual, we're very wrong on all. We're not actually not terrible. It, it, it's Lando Norris's fault that our predictions were wrong, and, it's, oh. and I'm, I'm not saying that as a bad thing because it was really good to see Lando doing well. But I don't think any of us called it. Well, no, I mean we. So you went for Stappen Hamilton Perez. I went for Stappen Perez Hamilton. Technically, it's Norris's fault because he pushed Perez off the track, <laughs> meaning he couldn't get into the podium position. So let's let's just. Let's just blame Nando Norris for <laughs> our, 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 our not very clever clever um, performances. Otherwise, we had our one like outstanding moment. Uh, you said Leclerc best of the rest. I mean, again, Norris is fault. <laughs> I almost... will say that. Now, technically, Carlos Sainz is as well, although Carlos Sainz, again, drove a very fantastic race on Sunday, so not to take anything away from him at all. I mean, Norris was, especially in qualifying, Norris was almost best, let alone best of the rest. I, I don't know how, if Norris is still doing this well, and the fact he's up in that top five, can we really, can we put him in that group now with the two Mercedes and the two Red Bulls, or is that a bit too far? I think, I think you just, I think if you put it, him in that group, it almost diminishes what he's doing, because he is in a midfield car, and he's putting it in. That, that the, is true, that, that is true. Ones. I suppose if you see what Daniel Ricciardo is getting out of that car, Perhaps you, it it does it does show truly what Norris is doing, but still, I think being up at the top, I think it's it, it's just a sign of how, how amazingly he is performing. And I think trying to make a best of the rest prediction now for the rest of the season, I think I will I will avert from doing that in the future. And then I said one of the big four out in qualifying, completely wrong. But, <laughs> I mean, Russell got into Q three, let alone someone dropping out of it. Yeah, that wasn't wasn't one of my best ones but i think what i'm gonna do is switch up the predictions and com- and not and be derivative of wtf1 and we'll go for three just general predictions because <laughs> i think i think we need to we need some we need to get some of these right at some point we'll still we'll still start with the top three um for the race i mean what what would you what would you put as your top three the thing is we don't know how good mercedes upgrades are mm at the moment and it could be that they take them back to the front up with Red Bull and Lewis Hamilton has a fantastic record at this trap so it could be that that's the way Mercedes get back to the front or it's just smoke and mirrors and Mercedes don't really make any progress with it I'm going to be it's the home Grand Prix it's Lewis Hamilton's home race he's got a fantastic record at Silverstone and I think for a bit of the British Bulldog spirit striking back as the underdog I'm going to say that Lewis Hamilton is going to win the race on Sunday with Max Verstappen in second. And I am going to say Valtteri Bottas, I think will get on the podium in third. He does have a good record at Silverstone. And I think he's going to drive. I think it'll be a close race between him and Perez. And I wouldn't discount Lando Norris from that either. But I think it will be Hamilton, Verstappen, Bottas for the podium he's, on Sunday. He's gone for a classic Hamver, but <laughs> I think I think I'm going to have to go Hamver as well. I do think that even if, Hamilton doesn't have the doesn't have the up I did the upgrades are gonna help, obviously. You, mm. You'd really hope that they'd help, but the British crowd always seems to give him an extra extra 10, 15 percent. I mean, and since um since since the hybrid era, he's not he's only lost twenty eighteen and technically the, tw- the second one in twenty twenty when that was very much of course in the middle of August with the heat yeah. and the tires. Uh, the only thing I would say about Lewis Hamilton, actually, the only thing that could count against him was the Mercedes were the slowest cars in the speed traps in Austria. Now, we don't know if these upgrades are going to address that, 
But as well as having, obviously, high downforce corners, which typically suit the Mercedes, very long straights as well at Silverstone, where Red Bull have been doing quite well this season. So that could also be quite an interesting dynamic. Still think Lewis Hamilton will win, though. Yeah, so I'm going to go for a Hamilton Verstappen, and then I'm going to I'm going to put Lando Norris on the podium. Oh, I think that especially lightning because, strikes twice. Yeah, and especially because um, they did so well at Austria, you'd think that um, Silverstone's a fairly fairly similar track, a lot of high speed corners. Of, uh, it's, I think the first sector might be the only one that they come unstuck a bit is in the low the low low speed bit, but you think that the just the way Norris is going, he can't really. He can't. Yeah. I just... So as well as that, we need general predictions for the race. So I'll come to you, Cam. Give it. Give me three. I'm definitely not ripping anyone off here. Please don't sue me. <laughs> please, please don't sue me. <laughs> it, it's fine if, if w i mean firstly if wtf1 are watching us right now um hi thanks very much for tuning in and of, of course to have them watching raw sport as well you must be doing something right will I'll so take that. actually i'll take that <laughs> but, but don't do me I, 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 I am going to i am going to um tweet matt good. gallagher dm him now <laughs> and say come on matty you've got to start you've got to start watching our stuff more regularly <laughs> If, of course, oh. if he is watching now, that, that, that DM will be totally irrelevant. Anyway, um, so my three predictions. Um, I'm going to make a controversial one to start off with. We know we've been talking up George Russell quite a lot. But if there is one thing about um, this country, um, quite windy. And if there is one thing that the Williams does not like, the fact that it's very unsettled is wind. So even, I think, with the baking sun that we're expecting this weekend... I am going to say that George Russell, for the first time this season, he'll still out-qualify Latifi. That's academic. But he will not make it out of Q1 for the first time this season. Okay, I'd say that's out in Q1. I'd say that's my boldest prediction, I think. But I think just looking at the wind, and he's a good driver, George Russell, and he had, I, just, I just think this will be the weekend. Something's just intuition. Anyway, so my second prediction then, looking down at that midfield, I think that Aston Martin, I think, are going to have a very good weekend. I think also being their home race as well at Silverstone, it's a track, it's an environment that they know very well. And Racing Point have typically been very strong at Silverstone over the last few years. So I'm going to say, I think, a double points finish for Aston Martin. Okay. And my third prediction i think i'm just trying to think what other what other kind of trends have we had in formula one recently because the one obvious trend i can think of is a yuki sonoda crash in q1 but i feel silverstone's too wide a track that i feel it's too difficult for him to put it in the wall in q1 so i think i will instead say that i think this could be the weekend that daniel ricardo I think has that little boost with McLaren. I think he's starting to integrate himself more into that team. We've started to see a lot more consistency from Daniel Ricciardo. I do think Lando Norris may finish ahead. Well, I think we'll probably finish ahead of Daniel Ricciardo, but I'm going to say Daniel Ricciardo to finish ahead of both Ferrari drivers this weekend. Okay. Ricciardo ahead of Ferrari. I'm I'm just you know it's a student radio. I have to write. I just have to write it down on some paper. <laughs> we no no right. producer in the room next door just there's, to remind us of yeah. our bad predictions. Next there's time. no there's no producer. It's just <laughs> me. Right. So my predictions. I think there's going to be a tire blowout at some point this Ooh, weekend. That's because it, it's a trend. It does always. It's. I would say that Silverstone is the circuit that is toughest on the tires. I can't Partic- particularly of... the front lefts, front the mm. front left for front and rear lefts. To be honest, is a lot of load, a lot of loading on those tires throughout the weekend, and I think it's a lot to do with the downforce coming through the corners and the fact that the speed as well. So yeah, although do you think it could be limited to one particular session, or just a general blowout throughout the weekend? I mean, I did, I did mention before. If you do see the, if you do see any of the lower down runners going for a soft tire in sprint qualifying that could i don't know how what the distance of the soft tire is this um this this race but i can't imagine it's 17 laps so that could be a risk 
And I think, I mean, we've seen it. We saw it in Baku. Baku isn't an especially tough circuit on the tyres, you wouldn't think. There's and certainly high speeds high speed. and high downforce, which and I, I know they has I, an abundance. I know they've made changes to it, but you would think that it might. It, it's a 50-50 shot. If I'm right, I'm right, and I get one <laughs> point because because that's how we're doing it. Um, oh, what else? Oh, I think, you know what? I'm going to go bold. So, Russell, I'm going to say all the British drivers in the points. Okay. So I think we... I, I think I think you're very much relying on George Russell there, yeah. and Williams having a car, or, or that you're relying on there being either no wind, which completely wrecks my prediction, or Williams having an extraordinarily good car this weekend, which also ruins my prediction. So, what, what is the weather forecast? Is I think t- bone dry, bone dry yeah, and know, sunny. But it's, bone... it's just if it's windy or not that that makes all the difference. I I think I think. Being, I think, in sort of the Midlands, I think you can always expect a little bit of wind. Mm. So, well, that's that's why it's the pred- that's why the bold prediction. <laughs> it might it might work, it might not. And all oh, final one. Um, we haven't had a good. I, th- I we haven't had a good teammate collision in a while. I might go for a, a teammate collision. Any particular team you're thinking of? No, I'm going to go general. This is how you win. <laughs> You go really general and then get the point. So I'm really going teammate collision. You see, if I was, if I if I was to go for a team, I would prob I I would say Alpha Tauri, apart from the fact that Gazi and Snowder are normally very different Alpha parts Tauri. of the track for them to collide. So I think as a as a substitute, probably I would say Alpine or Alfa Romeo. Yeah, or I think Haas have got quite lucky so far, especially. Mm perhaps after safety cars. I do think there will probably be a safety car at some point, maybe from... So my tyre blowout is going to cause a teammate collision, which gets Ooh. Russell in the points. It's going to be like... if, if, if all three of those are connected, I'm just going to buy you a, buy I'm you with... one of those little marble lamps and you're going to be seeing into the future for the rest of the season because that would just blow my mind. Like the tyre. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's not much, not much else to say. So mine are Hamilton, Verstappen, Norris, tire blowout, all the Brits in the points, and a teammate collision. While Cam are Hamilton, Verstappen, Bottas, Russell out in Q1, Aston Martin with a double point score, and Ricardo ahead of both Ferraris. But I think that's that's it. Thank you. I mean, thank you for coming on, Cam. Obviously, it's the holidays. All got, all got I, I, ju- I just love talking about F1. I'm I'm absolutely loving loving these podcasts. So thanks again for having me on. That's fine. Thank you to WTF1 for 100 percent listening. <laughs> again, please don't sue me. And <laughs> other than that, I've been your host, Will Kingswood. This has been a Raw Sport F1 special, and thank you for listening.